our next speaker, who speaks to you about who holds the key, Pope or Prophet. He was the non-Catholic, and his wife was the Catholic. This is a conversion story, but this is a conversion story that is different again from Jack's. This is coming from an American who came from Salt Lake City in Utah, which, as you know, is the home for the Mormon faith. And he was a professional soldier, a veteran of 23 years' service in the Air Force and then later in the Army. His last tour of duty in the Pentagon, retired with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Army, came to Catholicism by a process known between him and God and his wife. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Clifford. Thank you very much. What a beautiful country you have here. And we're so pleased to be here. Thank you. My wife Anna was able to accompany me and we're thoroughly enjoying ourselves. I would ask you please to pray for me as I'm speaking to you that the Holy Spirit will use me as an instrument of his love so that I may say the words that God would have me say and that you may hear the words that God would have me say. So please pray for me. I have a great deal of information to go through, so um, I'm going to jump right into it. I have a very limited amount of time to do it in, so please forgive me if I rush it a little bit. The apostles failed in their mission. They neglected to properly appoint their successors. When the last apostles died, the keys of the kingdom of heaven were lost from the earth. The church given to them by Jesus lay in ruins, overcome by the forces of hell. The so-called Christian church was no longer the Lord's church. A new organization, a great and abominable church, came into existence. This wicked church, founded by the devil, became known as the Catholic Church. In her corruption, she took away many plain and precious parts of the gospel from the Bible, rendering it useful in conveying the full gospel plan. It remained an apostate church until the keys of the kingdom were once again restored to the earth through the prophet Joseph Smith. As a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, also called LDS or Mormon, I knew all of this was true. I knew the great apostasy happened. I knew Joseph Smith was a prophet of God and that he had been trusted with the task of bringing to mankind the Book of Mormon, the divinely inspired scriptures that were another testament of Jesus Christ. Most of all, I knew the church Joseph Smith had re restored and organized, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, was true. I knew all of this by the power of the Holy Spirit. After all, we Mormons just knew these things we had been taught by the church were true because we had complete and unquestioning trust in all that is Mormon. What is the basis for the Mormon theory of the great and total apostasy? The LDS Church claims to be a rest restoration of the original Church of Jesus Christ. In the 1820s, a young man named Joseph Smith, Jr. claimed to have received a series of heavenly visions in which he was told that all the sects of Christendom, including the Catholic Church, had fallen away from the truth. And none of them uh, still retained the authority of God. He and an associate, Oliver Cowdery, 
were supposedly ordained to the holy priesthood and the apostleship by heavenly messengers in 1829. And they organized the Church of Jesus Christ on April 6, 1830. According to the Mormons, living prophets and apostles, as well as the restored apostolic authority, have continued in the LDS Church from that time until today. How do we Catholics respond to this Mormon claim of a great and total apostasy of the early Christian church? Using the Bible and the writings of the early church fathers, we need to show our LDS brothers and sisters that Jesus Christ intended for his church to continue teaching the gospel with his authority until the end of time. We must explain how the early Christian church was Catholic in its organization, doctrines, and practices. If we can clearly demonstrate that there was no total apostasy in the early church and that the original deposit of faith with priesthood authority was carefully handed down to us through apostolic succession, then there is no need for a restoration of that which was lost. Obviously, there was, and probably always will be, individual apostasy from the church. However, in all of salvation history, there has never been a total apostasy of the church. The Mormons reply, rely upon uh, the four standard works, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and the King James Version of the Bible, as well as other official LDS church documents for their explanation of the total apostasy theory. These four standard works are considered a part of their canon of sacred scripture. For our, our purposes, I will limit the Mormon argument to the Holy Bible and quotes from the early church fathers. I will also provide a Catholic response to each of these claims. When Latter-day Saints speak of the apostasy, they primarily mean that priesthood authority was taken from the earth in response to rebellion. When no priesthood keys were left on the earth, the apostasy was complete or total. This rebellion and loss of authority was accompanied by some rejection of revealed truths. Christianity naturally drifted even further away from the revealed truth through the centuries. The evidence they use to support the total apostasy theory goes like this. They say that Paul spoke of the apostasy when he told the elders at Ephesus, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. The fact is that all churches have dissidents from within their own memberships, including the LDS Church. Individual apostasy does not necessarily mean that the entire church is in total apostasy. Mormons suggest that Paul had no illusions about the survival of the church when he wrote to Timothy that the saints would turn away from sound doctrine. We find in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to seek their own likings and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. As for you, always be steady, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. The LDS apologist would say that this shows how Paul entreated Timothy to do his duty as an evangelist, but those in his charge would forsake the faith. When we read this passage in the proper context, we can see that this refers to the last days before the second coming of Christ, not to the immediate days following the death of the last apostle. These citations do not indicate that it would be a total apostasy, 
only that some people will wander into myths. In fact, Paul is encouraging those who actually listen to the truth to be steadfast in their work and endure the suffering which apostasy invariably inflicts on the faithful. In the same letter, Paul intimated that all the people in Asia rejected him. And this is in 2 Timothy 1.15. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, and among them Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Mormon apologist would have us believe that Asia Minor is exactly where many, if not most, of the Christians lived. However, according to Isaiah Bennett in his book entitled Inside Mormonism, What Mormons Really Believe, the Asia mentioned in the New Testament refers to a small Roman province, Asia Minor or Anatolia, at the western tip of what is now Turkey. It did not indicate the continent of Asia that we speak of today. So the scale of this localized apostasy is not nearly as large as the Mormon argument would suggest in modern language. Mormons believe Peter also warned the saints of the impending apostasy. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, we read, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies and even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their licentiousness and because of them, the way of truth will be reviled. This passage sim simply tells us that as there have been false prophets in Israel, so there will also be false teachers among the Christian church. And many will follow does not mean that all will follow, simply that many will follow these false teachers. There's no total apostasy here. Latter-day Saints believe that the apostasy was underway even while the apostles were alive and that it inevitably completed its course after the last apostles were taken away. While the New Testament does not give many specifics about the timetable of the rebellion in its predictions, Mormons suggest it contains quite a few clues pointing to the fact that a massive rebellion was taking place in the church. And according to them, it appears that there was not much time left. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we read, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our assembling to meet him. We beg you, brethren, not to be quickly shaken in mind or excited, either by spirit or by word or by letter purporting to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Paul warns the Thessalonians that the second coming of Christ is not at hand, even if they receive a letter purporting to be from one of the apostles. Mormons claim that this falling away, which comes from the Greek word apostasia, indicates that the apostasy would soon overrun the church. However, Paul does not say that it will be a complete or total falling away from the church. What he does say is that the son of perdition will be revealed at the same time as the falling away. If the apostasy took place after the death of the last apostle, as the LDS suggests, then when was the son of perdition revealed? And who was he? Also, there is no indication that a restoration of the gospel would be interjected between the apostasy 
and the revelation of the son of perdition and the second coming of Christ. I have a number of other uh, references from the Bible that, that uh, I wish I had time to go into. Uh, if you've ever encountered the Mormon missionaries, they will bring up some of these verses from the Bible and try to show you how this total apostasy was foretold in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. So we as Catholics need to be prepared to answer these suggestions and these concepts that the Mormon missionaries will bring to you. What I would like to do is jump over to some of the early church fathers and, and talk a little bit about that. Once again, I, I must reaffirm that in all of salvation history, there has never been a total apostasy of the church. Only apostasy from the church by individuals in the church. And that's very, very important. Mormons believe this pattern of rebe rebellion continued into the second century, which has been dubbed the age of heresy. Clement of Rome, around the year 96 AD, chastised the Corinthians for ejecting a righteous bishop who had been appointed by the apostles. Ignatius of Antioch, in about 110 AD, rebuked some of the Magnesian Christians for rebelling against their bishop in the first decade of the second century. It is fitting then, says Ignatius, not only to be called Christians, but to be so in reality, as some indeed give one the title of bishop but do all things without him. Mormon suggests that there seems to have been some general problem in this area at that time, since Ignatius included exhortations to submit to the authority of the bishops in all but one of his six epistles to various churches. Apparently, there had been some serious schisms in Ignatius' own time in his own church at Antioch, for he requested that the Smyrnians send a delegate to Antioch to congratulate them that they are now at peace and are restored to their proper greatness and that their proper constitution has been reestablished among them. The facts of history as handed down to us in the writings of the early church fathers present strong evidence to support the Catholic Church's claim to apostolic succession. Their writings do not give any indication that the apostles were going about the business of shutting down the church after the resurrection and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. To the contrary, according to the early church fathers, the apostles were going out into the whole world, preaching the gospel, teaching the disciples the same truth that was taught to them by Christ, and appointing bishops to be their successors, to continue the teaching, to continue teaching Christian believers of future generations. All of the remaining apostles, with the exception of John the beloved disciple, subsequently suffered horrible martyrdom for their unswerving belief in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Many of their disciples suffered the same type of persecution and death rather than deny the truth they had received from the apostles and their successors. Through it all, the church remained steadfast in the faith and continued to grow. I think it's especially important that um, we, we read a little bit about the first epistle um, of uh, Clement, if you get a chance to read those, but also um, Irenaeus wrote uh, against the heresy of Gnosticism um, between the years about 180 and 199 AD. Irenaeus wrote, It is possible then for everyone in the church who may wish to know the truth to contemplate the tradition of the apostles which has been made known throughout the whole world. And we are in a position to enumerate those who were instituted bishops by the apostles and their successors to our own times, men who neither knew nor taught 
anything like these heretics rave about. For if the apostles had known hidden mysteries, which they taught to the elite secretly and apart from the rest, they would have handed them down, especially to those very ones to whom they were committing the self-same churches. For surely they wished all those and their successors to be perfect and without reproach to whom they handed on their authority. Irenaeus goes on to say, but since it would be too long to enumerate in such a volume as this, the succession of all the churches, we shall confound all those who, in whatever manner, whether through self-satisfaction or vainglory, or through blindness and wicked opinion, assemble other than where it is, a, is proper. By pointing out here the succession of bishops of the greatest and most ancient church known to all, founded and organized at Rome by the two most glorious apostles, Peter and Paul. That church which has the tradition and the faith which comes down to us after having been announced to men by the apostles. For with this church, because of its superior origin, all churches must agree, that is, all the faithful in the whole world. And it is in her that the faithful everywhere have maintained the apostolic tradition. Irenaeus goes on. This is, this is good stuff. I love church history. The true gnosis, which means knowledge, is the doctrine of the apostles and the ancient organization of the church throughout the whole world and the manifestation of the body of Christ according to the successions of bishops by which successions the bishops have handed down the church which is found everywhere and the very complete tradition of the scriptures which have come down to us by being guarded against falsification and which were received without addition or deletion and reading without falsification and a legitimate and diligent exposition according to the scriptures without danger and without blasphemy and the preeminent gift of love which is more precious than knowledge and more glorious than prophecy, and more honored than all the charismatic gifts. That doesn't sound like a church in the process of shutting itself down through total apostasy. Irenaeus was very clear on the fact that what he and the other uh, successors to the bishops and the apostles was teaching came from the apostles. Irenaeus was the second bishop of Lyons, in his youth, he was a disciple of Polycarp, the famous bishop of Smyrna, who himself was a disciple of John the Apostle. In his refu refutation and rejection of the false gnosis, Irenaeus not only exposes the doctrinal error of Gnosticism in no uncertain terms, but he also gives us the presentation of the true orthodox gnosis guaranteed by the tradition of the apostles. He tells us that the apostles instituted bishops as their successors. He also states that the greatest and most ancient church, superior to all other churches and founded by the apostles Peter and Paul, is the church at Rome. He goes on to say that the true gnosis is the doctrine of the apostles. This doctrine was handed down to the church through the succession of bishops from the apostles and was protected from falsification, addition, or deletion. Through his writings, we can get an idea of what the early Christian church received directly from the apostles. We should be able to compare this ancient organization described in the writings of Irenaeus to see if it more closely resembles the present day Catholic church or the restored church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We have 
the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church with their solid foundations in Holy Scripture and sacred tradition. I challenge my LDS brothers and sisters to carefully examine the writings of Irenaeus or any other early church father to find where the early Christian church clearly taught and believed uniquely Mormon doctrines, such as a premortal existence, baptism for the dead, plural marriages, the plurality of gods, or that man may become a god. Throughout the past 2,000 years of history, Christianity has been defined by a few basic truths. All who call themselves Christian have acknowledged these truths as fundamental to the faith. First is the belief in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Before we can believe anything else, we must first believe in God. Secondly, the faith of all Christians depends on our belief in the Holy Trinity as the central mystery of Christianity. We believe that the one God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons sharing one divine nature. Thus, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God three divine persons, really distinct and equal in all things, yet they are one and the same God, having one and the same divine nature and substance. The Trinity is a strict mystery because it could not be rationally conceived before the self-revelation of God, and it cannot be rationally comprehended or fully understood even since its re revelation. Another basic tenet of Christianity is the belief that Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. He suffered and died on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. He rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven. We also believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Furthermore, we believe in the mercy of God, that he will reward us for our good deeds. We also believe he is a God of justice, that he will punish those who have sinned. Therefore, in order to be saved, we must have faith, we must obey the commandments of God and of the church he established, we must have an active prayer life, that means we, meet, we need to communicate with and we need to listen to God. And we must put into practice what we have learned. God chose to reveal himself to the children of Israel. He inspired the prophets of old to write down and pass on their understanding of who God is and what he wants from us. The history of salvation starts with our first parents, Adam and Eve, using their free will to, di to disobey God by allowing themselves to be tempted to sin by the serpent, who was Satan. They and their offspring were cursed with the stain of original sin, which is the absence of God's presence restored to us through baptism. But God provided hope for the future. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all cattle and above all wild animals. Upon your belly you shall go and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This comes from Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. The woman that God was speaking of was the Virgin Mary. 
her seed was the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ. For in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. This comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. Jesus Christ, the second Adam, who was born of the Virgin Mary, the second Eve, came to redeem us from the sin of the first Adam and to reconcile us with God. In order to fulfill God's plan for our salvation, Jesus chose 12 apostles to receive the fullness of the gospel teachings. He specifically chose Peter to be the first in authority among the apostles. It was upon this rock, Peter, that Christ promised he would build his church. It was to Peter alone that Christ gave the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He also promised Peter infallibility, meaning the inability to err when teaching in matters of faith and morals. When he said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. Jesus Christ intended for his church to continue teaching the gospel with his authority until the end of time. Jesus is like the wise man who built his house the church on a rock, Peter. It did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. This comes from Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. He promised the gates of hell would not prevail against it when he said, you are Peter, Kepha in, in the Aramaic language, or rock, meaning rock, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. In Matthew chapter 18, uh, verses 15 to 18, Jesus commands his followers to take disputes involving religious matters to the church for resolution. He would not instruct us to do such a thing if he knew that the church would soon fall into total apostasy and become corrupted. The church must, out of necessity, always exist in order for Jesus to give such a command. Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20, provides the undeniable statement from Jesus that he would be with his church until the end of time. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. It is impossible for the church to apostatize and become doctrinally corrupt, for Jesus promised that he would always remain with his church. Lastly, St. Paul tells us that the church, the church is the pillar and ground or bulwark or foundation of the truth. This comes from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. These are very strong words used to indicate strength, stability, and permanence. In order to be the pillar and foundation Paul, uh, Paul speaks of, the church must be a permanent teacher of truth, not a temporary household built upon sand only to be rebuilt later. The 12 apostles chose others to be bishops, the Greek word um, meaning an overseer. These bishops were appointed by the apostles to continue their mission for Christ. The bishop has the authority and the power of Christ to administer all the sacraments, including the ordination of other men to the priesthood. Apostolic succession was first demonstrated in Acts chapter 1, verses 20 to 26, when Matthias was chosen to replace Judas. Every validly ordained bishop in the Catholic Church can trace his priesthood authority back through history to one of the 12 apostles. This authority has been passed on in an unbroken chain of ordinations by the laying on of hands from the apostles to their successors, the bishops, and to their successors, other bishops. 
and so on down the line through all of Catholic Christian history. The bishops of the Catholic Church are the successors to the apostles in a continuous line of apostolic succession. The Catholic Church has existed continuously since the time of the apostles, and it was founded as an earthly organization upon Peter the Rock. My brothers and sisters, the choices are quite simple. Either there was a total apostasy in the early Christian church, and the gospel of Jesus Christ was lost to the world for hundreds of years, or the Christian church has survived intact for almost 2,000 years through apostolic succession. If we accept the total apostasy theory, then we must believe that the gospel was lost and the promises of Christ set forth in the Bible are meaningless. For argument's sake, let's say that the gospel was restored through Joseph Smith. Even if that were true, we have no assurances that it will not be corrupted again. According to the Mormon teaching, Jesus Christ founded what would eventually become an apostate church built upon sand, both in the Holy Land and in the New World, according to the Book of Mormon. So Jesus lied when he promised the gates of hell would not prevail. Since he failed to establish a lasting church twice before, we may reasonably doubt whether he can succeed this time. Thus, logically, we cannot trust the word of God to contain the fullness of truth. Hence, the Mormon need for continuing revelation, which updates and changes the truth. However, if the total apostasy theory cannot be proven by biblical or historical evidence, then the ancient church is in fact the same Catholic church that we see today. No other Christian church can trace its authority unbroken back to the original apostolic source other than the one holy Catholic and apostolic church established by Jesus Christ. We can be confident that the original deposit of faith was carefully handed down to us through apostolic succession. We can also be sure that Jesus Christ kept his promises, that his church survived, and that it will continue to proclaim the fullness of truth until the end of time. Thank you very much, and God bless you.